What's up everyone and welcome to the Comic Hood. The Eternals is finally out and like all the Marvel movies, it does have post-credit scenes. And that's exactly what we'll be discussing in this video, along with the ending and how the movie may shape the future of the MCU. You can check out our spoiler-free review of The Eternals if you haven't watched the movie yet, cause this video is filled with spoilers. So consider yourselves warned, but if you have watched the movie and want to understand the end credit scenes in a better way, you are at the right place. With all that said, let's dive in. So the movie as you all know is based on the 10 immortal beings called the Eternals who came to earth to save humanity from the monsters called the Deviants and both of the beings created by the Celestials. You might be wondering why would they even create the Deviants as they are monsters or why even bother to create the Eternals. Well here's the reason. By now you all might be knowing that the Celestials are the gods of the Marvel Universe in comics as well as the MCU and they like experimenting with lower life forms by creating, observing and destroying them. So the plot is Celestials created the Deviants to destroy the apex predators on the newly created planet like the dinosaurs on earth so that when these apex predators are cleaned out, there is a possibility for the newer intelligent life form to develop on the planet. And the sole reason Celestials want this to happen is that a larger number of intelligent population can give birth to a new Celestial. Let me explain. So these cosmic godlike beings don't create new Celestials the usual way. They plant a seed created by them into the core of a new planet where it can absorb the energy of the planet and its intelligent life form for millions of years. And when the time is right, the seed hatches giving birth to a new Celestial which emerges from the planet's core by destroying the planet. And it was a Celestial Diamond who is also called the Dreaming Celestial that was supposed to hatch from the seed. This process is called the emergence. The Celestials need the new members of their race in order to create new galaxies and life forms who can go on to exist in different universes. But the Deviants had a flaw which was the fact that they could evolve. Hence they didn't stop at killing the Apex Predators but also went on to kill the intelligent life forms. And as you can guess this was a big no-no for the Celestials. And in order to stop this from happening they created the powerful immortal androids called the Eternals. Initially when the Eternals arrived on Earth they believed that their sole mission was to destroy all the Deviants and protect the humans from them. They were unaware of the fact that the planet was nurturing a seed of the celestial at its core which would eventually destroy the planet. Only Ajak, the leader of the Eternals, knows about the true nature of their mission and because after each mission, the memories of the Eternals are reset at the World Forge which is the place they were created. Eventually Ajak tells this information to Icaris and even though she has helped Celestials to destroy many planets, she has a change of heart when it comes to Earth as humans have deeply impacted her and now wants to stop the emergence. The emergence was delayed due to Thanos snap and now that the population is restored, it has provided enough energy for the emergence to occur. Icarus doesn't agree with Ajak as he is loyal to the Celestial Arishim and in order to prevent the Eternals from knowing the truth, he ends up killing Ajak by letting a Deviant absorb her powers. Yeah, that happens. But after her death, Ajak transfers the leadership to Cersei and gives her the power that Ajak used in order to talk with the Celestials. Meanwhile, Icarus is trying to make sure that the Eternals don't learn the truth but while talking to Arishim, Cersei learns about their true mission and informs the Eternals. They regroup and form a plan to stop the Emergence by using the power of Druig who can mind control and put the Emerging Celestial to sleep. During the final stages of the film, the Eternals battle Icarus and it is Cersei who ends up turning the emerging Celestial completely into marble with the combined powers of other Eternals through the Unimind which basically is the concentrated form of power that is created from the powers of all the Eternals combined. Even we see the Unimind in the comics where the Eternals use it to fight Celestials. Icarus then apologizes for his actions and ends up flying directly into the sun. Whether he died or survived is still unclear but I believe since he is an immortal and really powerful character the studios might bring him back for future projects. This also is a reference to the Greek mythology of Icarus who flew close to the sun. Speaking about references, there are also other references in the movie, especially references from DC characters like Batman and Superman. Yes, I'm not kidding. I don't know what kind of talks the studios went through to put that in place but listening to those references was interesting. Also the fans went crazy in the theatre when they heard it. Then we see Thena, Makari and Druig are off the planet in their spaceship in order to find the other Eternals who are spread across the galaxy and Sprite now is turned into a normal human being and is attending school. Coming to the ending of the movie, we see Cersei and Dane Whitman are having a private talk as they are strolling the park, Dane Whitman being a normal human who is dating Cersei and has found out about her powers and is trying to understand the whole thing but also says that no matter what, he still loves her. But just then, the sky darkens and a really pissed off Arishim arrives at Earth and yanks out the remaining Eternals from the planet into space and tells them that they might have sacrificed the Celestial in order to save a planet but he'll decide whether he'll let the planet live only after reading all their memories and will come back for the judgement as he disappears along with the Eternals into a black hole. Coming to the explanation, I believe they are taken to the same place they were created which is the world forge and after Arishim is done reading the memories he indeed will come back because even in the comics the celestials arrive on a planet four times which are spread across thousands of years that are called the four hosts and in the final visit which is called the judgment they decide the fate of the planet. I explained the complete story of these hosts in a separate video which you can check it out. Also I believe that we'll be getting to know other celestials and cosmic beings maybe even Galactus in the future projects as MCU is working on the Fantastic Four movie. So that's about the ending and let's talk about the post credit scene and there are two of them. 
One is the mid credit scene and the other is the end credit scene. I have a lot to talk about the mid credit scene and I'll get to that in a bit but let's discuss the final end credit scene first. At the final end credit scene when the whole credits are rolled out we see Dane Whitman in a room that is filled with historical artifacts and stuff. Probably guessing it's his family room where he stores all the stuff from his ancestor or some kind of museum or library as he works at a university teaching students. Among these artifacts lying on the table is a wooden box that has a symbol of the black knight where the words death is my reward are written in Latin. We see him acting all anxious about opening the box but finally decides to open and finds the sword and the costume for the Night's Watch who want him at the Great Wall. Just kidding. He indeed finds a sword that is wrapped with an ancient cloth and the weapon is the Ebony Blade created by Merlin the wizard. Here's a little history on this weapon. The blade was forged from a meteor and was created for its first wielder Sir Percy of Scandia who lived in 6th century and served the court of King Arthur. He was the first one to become the character Black Knight. More about the character in a minute. But during the battles he fought, he went on to kill many people with the sword and hence the weapon became cursed. It drives the wielder insane and makes him violent while also giving him minor mystic powers and immortality. The blade is also able to cut through mystic barriers and adamantium, the strongest metal in the Marvel universe. It absorbs souls to grow stronger and unlike Mjolnir, it is most powerful with the unworthy and impure of the hearts. The blade was passed on to Sir Percy's descendants and obviously Dane Whitman is one of them. We also hear many whispers like the spirit voices immediately when the box is opened which probably are the spirits of the people that were killed by the sword. At the beginning of the movie, Cersei also gifted Dane a ring with his family crest on it which she jokingly said she bought it on eBay but clearly she has had it with herself for ages. During the ending of the movie, Dan Whitman also tells Cersei that he has an unusual family tree but doesn't get the time to explain it as she gets taken away by Arishim. Here he is referencing to the previous individuals who held the ebony blade and took up the mantle of Black Knight. In the middle of the movie, Cersei tells Dan that it would be the right time to make things right with his uncle as the world was ending. Here his uncle is definitely Nathan Garrett. In the comics, Nathan Garrett has also been a Black Knight and wielded the blade and went on to do terrible things but as he was dying, he told his nephew, Dan, to learn from his mistakes and be a better Black Knight as he hands him the sword. And this is what might have occurred in the Marvel Cinema universe and hence Dane is not fond of his uncle but his uncle is still alive and no wonder Dane was so anxious to pick up the sword. In the comics, Dane indeed becomes a better black knight than his uncle and helps many heroes in fighting villains and threats. Once he was also part of the Avengers. Returning back to the movie, we see that just as Dane is about to touch the sword, we hear a male voice that asks, are you sure about it Mr. Whitman? As Dane turns to face the voice, but the scene is cut right there as the audience is left to wonder who the mystic character was. And as confirmed by the director, Chloe Zhao, it indeed is the voice of the famous vampire hunter, Blade himself. I can confirm is Mr. Blade himself. And I'm so excited to see him in the MCU as I grew up watching the original Blade trilogy films and I enjoy watching Vampire Hunters and especially Blade. Come on, the movie trilogy had some great action and fight sequences when it came out. And as a kid, I really loved watching him turn vampires to dust. The Blade movie is supposed to release in 2023 and we may get to see Dane Whitman in the film fighting vampires alongside Blade as Blade deals with the supernatural beings who are oppressing the humans. There is also a possibility that Blade is the one who might train Dane to use the sword as he is a great swordsman and combatant himself. And that's what we thought about the end credit scene. That brings us to the mid credit scene and it's the most interesting among the two. Here we see Thena, Druig and Makari on the celestial spaceship who are wondering why they haven't heard from the Eternals who are on the Earth for two weeks. Just then a strange portal resembling the Bifrost opens up in the spaceship and we see Pip the Troll coming out of it all drunk with a glass full of booze in his hand as he jokes about not teleporting drunk anymore. And he is played by the man himself, Mr. Patton Oswalt. And here's a quick background of the character from the comics. Pip was the prince of planet Laxidia who fancied painting. He became mutated into a troll after eating an enchanted stew at a troll celebration which gave him root instincts. He then was kicked out of his court for decadence and while wandering different places, he met Adam Warlock and became one of his greatest friends and allies. He has also been a member of Infinity Watch who makes sure to guard the Infinity Stone so that their powers won't be abused and due to the prolonged exposure to them, he has gained the power to teleport himself and others through space at will along with superhuman strength. He also has the ability to know the location of any person he wants and hence can teleport there instantly. As Pip the Troll arrives in the movie, he is also followed by another visitor who the Troll introduces as Eros, the brother of of Thanos himself, who is played by none other than Harry Styles. And yeah, the fans are going crazy after seeing him in the MCU. Eros compliments Thena for her beauty and then pulls out the same spear that Ajak used in order to speak to the Celestials and says to Thena, Druig and Makari in a relaxed tone that their friends are in a big trouble and he knows how to find them. It's possible that Eros was the leader of a similar eternal group and has decided to go against the Celestial or it's just possible he's leading them right back to Arishem because the Celestial ordered him to. I think it's the former reason because if Celestial wanted to find these Eternals, he would just pop in front of them as he has that power. 
Anyways, looks like he is the one who is ahead of the Eternals of Earth in gathering the other Celestials out in space. And I know what you guys are thinking, no, neither Thanos nor Eros were adopted and both of them are biological children of their parents. Well, Eros, apart from being the brother of Thanos, is also the Prince of Titan, the homeworld of Thanos, even though Thanos is elder than him. In comics, this is due to the reason that since the moment Thanos was born, he was looked like an outcast due to his appearance and the reason for Thanos looking the way he does is due to the deviant gene. In comics, Eros is one of a jolly character who spends his time having fun exploring planets and also with the company of many women. He is an eternal and possesses all their abilities like longevity, flight, accelerated healing and super strength, speed and endurance. But his special power is the ability to change emotion in other beings which he has used many times on women to make them romantically attracted to him. The casting makes more sense now. He went on to take things seriously when Thanos went on to destroy their home planet and kill their mother. Eros ends up joining the Avengers in order to stop his brother when Thanos gets the Infinity Gauntlet and it is here that he receives the name Star Fox. But now that Thanos isn't around anymore, it's curious to see what bigger goal will Eros work for in the MCU. In comics, Eros even went on to resurrect Thanos from the dead and we hope he doesn't do the same in the MCU. Also Pip introduces Eros to the Eternals by the titles Royal Prince of Titan, Brother of Thanos, The Naive of Hearts and Defeater of Black Roger. In comics, Black Roger is the guy who was trying to impress a girl who Eros liked but fails and she ends up with Eros. With all these titles, it's clear to say that Eros is still at the beginning of his journey as a hero and, and loves enjoying a carefree and fun-filled life because he doesn't have great achievement yet. But it's interesting to see where the studios take this character. We also know that Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 is releasing in late 2023 and it is introducing Adam Warlock into the MCU and Pip and the Eternals may team up with him. But what great threat might Warlock have to face now that Thanos is no more or are they planning to revive Thanos somehow? We will have to wait till the second Eternals movie if that is happening to find out more about how Eros will be portrayed and what's the fate of the other Eternals. That is if they don't show all of that in any other movie. The movie also leaves us with many questions like how many Eternals are out there? What's Sprite's future? Does she still have her powers and will she be a part of the Young Avengers? Are the Celestials the new villains which our heroes must assemble and fight all endgame style and is Icarus still alive? Also we know that Eternals are shown as androids in contrast to the comics where they are living beings. But we also know that Thanos wasn't an android so shouldn't that make even Eros a non-android or does he have a different origin than the usual Eternals? Hopefully the studio answers these questions as phase 4 progresses. Well, that was our breakdown of the ending and the post credit scene, but do let us know what are your thoughts and theories. How do you think the studios will move ahead with the characters like Black Knight, Eros and Blade? I would love to hear your thoughts. That brings today's episode to an end and we'll be releasing new videos. And if you enjoy the episode, do hit the like button and also subscribe to our channel for more comic content and updates. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Comic Hood and for all things comics, keep watching The Comic Hood.